Hello and welcome to the last chapter of Physics 101, Chapter 16. In this chapter, we're going to continue to investigate some of the interesting effects of uh, waves. In particular, uh, we're going to focus on sound waves and some of the um, neat uh, effects and uh, phenomena that we can do with sound. In this first part of the video, we're going to look at superposition and standing waves. Um, so in part one of this uh, video, uh, we'll do we'll look at the superposition principle, um, a, uh, a phenomenon called interference, and we'll look at beats and standing waves. And then in part two, the last part of our course, um, we will uh, look at musical instruments and speech and hearing. So let's start with the superposition principle, and in particular, a couple of the interesting um, outcomes of this, which is interference and beats. So the superposition principle states that uh, when two or more waves are present, the net amplitude is the sum of the individual amplitudes. In other words, when there are uh, two or more waves present at the same time, all we have to do is add up the waves to get the resulting effect. So there's a couple ways we can look at this. This is These are actual uh, photographs taken of two pulses traveling along a string. So wave one here is this pulse here, and it's moving to the right. Wave two is this pulse over here, and it's moving to the left. So you can see what happens is when these two waves um, actually um, overlap each other, notice the, the result is the amplitude is greater. And that's because we're adding the effects of wave one and wave two together to get a larger overall wave. But then what's kind of interesting here is what happens is these two waves, they basically pass through each other and they keep moving. So this is wave one now over here on the right. It's moving away to the right and wave two is moving to the left. So these, these two waves, they basically um, briefly interact with each other here, but then they pass right through each other and keep traveling on their own ways. Um, another um, example, uh, this illustration here kind of shows the effects of superposition in a little more detail. Let's suppose we have a triangular shaped wave here that's moving to the right at one meter per second. And over here, we have a rectangular pulse shaped like this moving to the left at one meter per second. So what happens is as they approach each other at um, a second later, they've each moved one meter. So they just start to um, interact right here. They're just beginning to touch. Now notice when they overlap here, we can see the triangular wave here is basically sitting on top of this rectangular wave here. This is the superposition principle. Remember, we're adding this amplitude of this triangle here. We're adding that to the rectangle here to get this shape. And then as the triangular wave moves to the right and the rectangular wave moves to the left a little more, they start to um, overlap less. In fact, now the uh, triangular wave is starting to go beyond where the rectangular wave is. And we see half of it is sticking out here. The other half is still on top of the rectangular wave. So by superposition, we have to keep you know adding those two together. But once uh, a second later, once the triangular wave has moved to the right and the rectangular wave moved to the left, they are no longer overlapping. And notice they look exactly as they did up here, but they've switched positions now because remember, this one is moving to the right and this one is moving to the left. The most important effect of superposition is called constructive and destructive interference. So constructive interference occurs when we have two waves that are in phase. And what we mean by in phase is that the peaks of both waves line up uh, with time and, and with uh, space too, and they're in the same position. And notice the troughs also line up. So what happens here, remember by superposition, we have to add this to this. So when we add these together, we get a resultant wave with twice the amplitude of the um, individual wave. So if the amplitude here is A, the amplitude here is 2A because we're adding this A 
to this A down here, and we're getting a, um, a stronger wave. So if this was a sound wave, we would basically have a louder sound right here as a result of this constructive interference. So we say that these two waves are interfering with each other constructively to produce a stronger wave. Now, look what happens in this case. What if the two waves are out of phase? In other words, this crest aligns with this trough and vice versa. The trough up here aligns with the crest here. So when we add these two together, remember that crests are positive if we think of the amplitude being above this uh, dotted line here, whereas down here the trough is a negative value. So when we add these two waves together, something very interesting happens. The two waves completely cancel each other out and we're left with no wave at all. So this is called destructive interference. The two waves interfere with each other destructively such that no resulting wave um, exists anymore. And if these were two sound waves, individually they would be heard uh, quite easily and, and they would both be loud by themselves, but if we were to play them together like this out of phase, they would actually cancel each other and we would not hear anything. And this is a, a very fascinating phenomena that we're going to look at. Uh, we already saw uh, in the previous chapter how the loudspeaker works. Remember the loudspeaker has this speaker cone that vibrates back and forth and creates sound waves. So um, what we're going to do in this demonstration is we're going to have two speakers connected um, to a signal generator and we are going to play the sound in these speakers for both in phase and out of phase. So let's um, watch that um, video right now. So we're going to do an experiment here to uh, investigate the effects of interference with sound waves. So I've got two speakers here. These are two stereo speakers and they're both connected to a signal generator back here which is producing a tone of 600 Hertz which is 600 cycles per second. So that's the tone we're hearing right now. And I've got both of these speakers connected to the same source and they're connected in phase. And what I mean by that is on the back of the speaker, there's a red wire and a black wire. And so I've connected red to red and black to black so that the two speakers are in phase. So what we're hearing now is constructive interference. So if I point these two speakers directly at each other like this, we can still hear a very loud tone. Now listen, listen what happens when I switch the wires so that I connect red to black and black to red. Now both speakers are still playing a loud tone individually, but when they're played together like this, they're 180 degrees out of phase. So in other words, we're hearing the effects of destructive interference right now, and the sound waves are basically canceling each other out. If I bring them back apart, um, you can probably hear the, the sound starts to get louder again as, uh, as they don't interfere as easily when they're farther apart. The effect that we saw in the video with the constructive and destructive interference, um, the uh, destructive interference has an interesting application. Um, you may have heard or even used noise canceling headphones. And basically the way they work is the headphones have a microphone that picks up the ambient sound in the environment that you're in. For example, you might be in a loud uh, area where there's construction noise or uh, helicopter pilots use them. And what the headphones do is they pick up the sound in the microphone and they play it back in your ears in real time, but they basically um, flip the wires, you know, so to speak, just like I did in my demo. And this causes the sound coming out of the headphones to be out of phase with the sound, you know, from the environment. And as a result, they cancel each other and you hear nothing. So it turns out that interference, um, you know, in addition to the way we did it in the uh, video demo, um, the other way you can get constructive or destructive interference is by having the two sounds uh, or two sources of sound, for example, these two speakers here, um, if they are at a different distance from the observer over here, then the sound has a different path length for each speaker. 
because one's farther away than the other. So interference will depend on the difference in path length. So this path length difference determines whether we hear constructive interference, like in this picture here, notice the two sound waves are overlapping and they're both in phase, or in this picture here, the sound waves are one half of a wavelength apart, and so when one is at a peak, the other is at a trough, and vice versa. So these two sound waves, because they're completely out of phase, are going to cancel each other, and there's going to be no resulting wave. So the condition here for constructive interference, notice that this speaker is exactly one wavelength behind the other speaker. And that ensures that the, remember this, you know, this wave repeats itself every wavelength. So by having it exactly one wavelength behind speaker number one, these waves are still in phase. So the constructive interference uh, condition is we need the path length difference, delta D is the distance between these two sources, has to be a multiple of the wavelength. So notice this would work for one lambda, or if we moved speaker two back another lambda, they would still be in phase because every lambda, remember, the wave pattern repeats. So as long as the path length difference delta D is equal to an integral uh, multiple of the wavelength lambda, so M can be any integer, one, two, three, four, etc. we will have constructive interference. On the other hand, in this case, we have the two speakers are a half wavelength apart, which forces them to be completely out of phase. So in this case, the path length difference is one half, or it could be one and a half, or two and a half, or three and a half, etc. wavelengths. So here again, M is just an integer that counts, one, two, three, four, etc. And our equation here is, and uh, this is an integer plus one half number of wavelengths, lambda. So in a, a case like this, which is um, more two-dimensional or even three-dimensional, let's suppose we have two speakers like this, and they're playing the same sound, and these two speakers are in phase, but we're listening over here at this point. So we're um, notice the, the sound from this speaker travels D1, the sound from this speaker travels farther, D2, to get to us, which we're right over here. So we want to know what is the sound here? Do we hear a loud sound, constructive interference, or a soft sound, destructive interference? Well, the path length here, delta D, is just D2 minus D1. So we might have to do a little geometry um, or measuring to figure out what these distances are. But once we know the distances, we can figure out the path length, and then we can apply those criteria for constructive interference, the path length has to be an integral multiple of lambda, and for destructive interference, when we would hear no sound, the path length would have to be an integer plus one half times the wavelength lambda. Another really fascinating effect of sound is the um, effect called beats. Beats are a pulsating, throbbing sound heard when two slightly different frequencies are heard together. And we'll see a demo of this shortly, but let's look and see how this works. So imagine we have two sound sources. Um, this we'll call the first one uh, wave one, that's the blue one here. And so it has a frequency F1. And wave two, the second sound source, uh, we'll call it wave two, and it has frequency F2. Now, looking at these, it's hard to tell but it turns out that F1, the blue wave here, is slightly higher than F2. You can kind of see that these peaks are a little bit closer together. That means it's a slightly higher frequency. It really becomes obvious if we overlay these two. Now remember what superposition is all about is, is basically taking the two waves and overlapping them and then adding their amplitudes together. So something interesting happens here when we overlap these two waves. When we combine them like that, notice what happens is that right here, the two waves, the pink and the blue, are in phase. So this is going to be constructive interference. This is going to produce a very loud sound. But over here, notice because they're not the same wavelength as we move here, they start getting out of phase. And when we're right here, they're, they're exactly out of phase. This is destructive interference, and so we expect to hear no sound. So the amplitude is 
basically small or zero. But then as we keep moving to the right, the waves start to catch up with each other again, um, you know, in frequency, and now they're overlaid again, and they're in phase. So this is gonna produce a loud sound. And then as we keep going to the right, we're out of phase, in phase, out of phase, and in phase. So what we actually hear is the combined amplitudes of this blue and this pink wave produces a loud sound, a soft sound, a loud sound, a soft sound, etc. And if you do the mathematics for this, which we're not going to do in this course, but it's uh, not that difficult, the um, frequency of these beats, all right, the, these are, this is loud, soft, loud, soft. So these beats that we hear are these throbbing sounds. The beat frequency is simply the difference between the two frequencies. It's the high frequency minus the low frequency. So let's go ahead and look at um, and listen to a demo um, of beats where we're gonna use two speakers connected to um, two different sources and we will intentionally um, change the uh, frequency of one of the speakers just a little bit so we can hear the beats. So I'm here in my lab and I have two speakers here from a stereo and they're both connected to this device back here which is called a signal generator and the signal generator has two outputs each output is driving a different speaker and I've got them both set to 600 Hertz right now 600 cycles per second so that's the tone you're hearing now since the two speakers are set to the exact same frequency we don't hear any beats it's a steady tone so let me set one of the speakers to 601 Hertz so this is 601 and this is 600 so listen for the beats now we're hearing a beat frequency of 1 Hertz or 1 cycle per second uh, remember the formula for beat frequency is just the difference between the two frequencies gives us the beat frequency so 601 minus 600 gives us 1 uh, beat per second. Let's go to 602. Now we're hearing two beats per second. 602 here, 600 here, the difference is two beats per second. Let's go to three. Three beats per second. 604, 600, four beats per second, and so on. This is 605, 606, 607, 8, 9. So here we have 610 and 600. So we're actually hearing 10 beats per second, which uh, if we listen carefully, you can hear it, but they're pretty fast. And I can keep going up from there. And now we can start to hear the, the difference in tone between the two speakers. They sound really out of tune now. And the beats are so fast now, this would be about 25 beats per second. We don't hear them anymore. So let's go back down. All right, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go to 600.1 and 600. So the difference is only 0.1. Let me, let me go here now. The difference now is 0.1 Hertz which is a tenth of a beat uh, per second. What that means is it takes 10 seconds for the full beat frequency. Soft, loud, all right, five seconds later, soft again, and then loud. So every five seconds it changes from soft to loud with 10 seconds for a total uh, beat, uh, beat period and one-tenth of a hertz for our beat frequency. Before we talk about our next uh, subject, just um, in regards to the beat frequency demo we just heard, um, this is very practical for musicians. They can um, basically tell if their instrument is in tune or out of tune. Um, our ear is usually not uh, sensitive enough to listen or to detect um, one or two hertz of different pitch but if we have an instrument let's say two instruments are going to play together uh, in a duet in a concert 
they both play the same note, if they are perfectly in tune, there'll be no beats heard. But if one instrument is just a little sharp or a little flat, that means you know the pitch is just a slightly bit higher or lower, then um, beats will be heard. And you know we heard in the, the demo, the video, um, they're very easy to detect. And the uh, musicians know that they're not in tune and they can tune their instruments. Okay, let's move on to our next topic, which is standing waves. This is another very important um, and practical uh, application of uh, studying waves, and there's some very interesting phenomena that we're going to look at as well. So let's start by watching um, a video demo uh, from another instructor um, that I think you'll find uh, entertaining. Today's demonstrations will involve a string fixed at both ends. The left end is attached to an oscillator which will be oscillating up and down in simple harmonic motion at a known frequency. And the right end is at a constant tension which is caused by a constant hanging mass. Okay, let's turn it on and see what happens. That is a standing wave pattern. Cool! Yay. I don't get it. The string is just going up and down. Okay, let's watch what happens when I change the oscillator to 30 hertz. And let's add a top view which is zoomed in to show the oscillator and the left half of the string. Remember, the oscillator is now moving up and down 30 times every second. Uh, why isn't anything moving? That is a good question. Yeah. Wait a second, look, look at the hanging mass in the lower right hand corner. It's moving like this is a normal what? video. What? The frame rate of this video is 30 frames per second. Oh, so we are looking at 30 pictures of the demonstration every second, and the oscillator is going up and down 30 times every second. That means the oscillator and string return back to the same location 30 times a second, and then the video camera takes a picture of it. That looks weird. Which is why every video I show of the demonstrations from here on out will be 32 times slower than real speed. And now you can see what is actually happening in the standing wave pattern. Let's now put three different frequencies on the screen at the same time to better see the differences between the three standing wave patterns. You know, I still don't really get it. The string is just going up and down in all those examples. Okay, well, how about this? I will use some video editing trickery to add an echo of each wave pattern so you can better see the three standing wave patterns being created. Whoa, there are like different humps. Yeah, one, two, and three humps depending on the frequency. Right, but the string is still just going up and down. It's just there is a pattern showing how they go up and down. Dare I say a standing wave pattern? Absolutely, Billy. These are the standing wave patterns. However, I want to remind you of what is going on here, which I can demonstrate by plucking the string. The wave pulses created by the oscillator are sent down the string, reflected and inverted, and then sent back down the string. The wave pulses going back and forth constructively and destructively interfere with one another and set up the standing wave patterns. You just do not see the wave pulses which are going back and forth. All you see is the resulting standing wave pattern, which is why I have created this animation to show you the wave patterns which constructively and destructively interfere to create the standing wave patterns. <laughs> That's cool. Well, what is that? I don't know. Actually, let's look at the individual parts of the animation. The blue periodic wave is moving to the right and represents the periodic wave which is being generated by the wave oscillator. The red wave is moving to the left and represents the periodic wave which is the result of the blue wave being reflected and inverted by the fixed end on the right. But the truth is that neither of those waves exists by themselves. What we actually see is the constructive and destructive interference of those two waves creating the black standing wave pattern. Now, let's pause the animation to discuss what happens at specific points. With the waves paused here, Billy, tell me what you see. At this point, uh, the, the red and blue waves have the same amplitude, 
but are mirror images of one another. Then we get total destructive interference. Right. The red and blue waves completely cancel one another out, and the result is just a flat string. Absolutely. At this point, there is total destructive interference of all waves, and the net result is no wave at all. And Bobby, what do you see when we pause the animation here? Uh, well, the red wave is in the same location as the blue wave, right? Correct. Then the two waves constructively interfere with one another and create the same wave shape as the red and blue waves, only with twice the amplitude, right? That is correct, Bobby. At this moment, both waves constructively interfere with one another and create the standing wave with twice the amplitude. And pattern. On this standing wave pattern, there are seven locations of total destructive interference. Those are called nodes. There are also six locations between the nodes called anti-nodes, where the waves create a larger amplitude wave via constructive interference. Nodes are locations of total destructive interference where the standing wave is always at equilibrium. And anti-nodes are locations where there is a large amplitude due to constructive interference. Got, Got it. it. Um, you both just stole my thunder. Yeah. yeah. Okay, let's switch back to the real demonstration rather than the animation and identify the locations of the nodes and anti-nodes. Also, I have added 61 and 76 hertz as well, to show a total of five standing wave patterns. Uh, I do not really see the standing wave patterns. Where are they? I think I can see them. Oh, right, sorry. I'll, I'll add my video echo of each wave to make it easier to see the nodes and anti-nodes. Is it easier to see them now? Sure. 15 hertz has two nodes, one on each end and one anti-node in the middle. 30 hertz has three nodes, one on each end and one in the middle and two anti-nodes, one between each pair of nodes. 45 hertz has four nodes, again, one on each end, and then two more nodes, which split the string into three parts, where at the center of each part is an anti-node. I think I'm sensing a pattern here. Uh, starting at 15 hertz with one anti-node and two nodes, we add one anti-node and one node for every 15 hertz we add to the frequency. Yes, it's pretty close to that, although clearly it is not quite 15 hertz because the standing wave pattern is set up at 61 and 76 hertz, not 60 and 75 hertz. Wait, do you mean the standing wave pattern will not work at other frequencies? Yes, that is a very important thing to realize, Bobby. Take a look at these two examples, which are at frequencies which are between the frequencies where we were able to set up standing wave patterns. I'm showing you both with and without the echo video effect. Do you see how there is no standing wave pattern being created at either of these two frequencies? Yeah. Sure. yeah. But why? Why is there no standing wave pattern being created at these frequencies? Does it have to do with the fact that each end has to be a node? That's right. Each end is a fixed end and is therefore a node. The standing wave pattern at 15 hertz represents half a wavelength. The, the pattern at 30 hertz represents one full wavelength. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, each standing wave pattern has to have an integer multiple of half a wavelength. Right. Because each end has to be a node, only integer multiples of half wavelengths will fit to create standing wave patterns along the string. That makes sense. Great job, everybody. In summary, standing wave patterns are waves generated in a medium which interfere with the waves which are reflected to create a pattern of waves which appear to stand in place. That's why they are called standing waves, duh. Nodes are locations where the wave interferences cause total destructive interference. Anti-nodes are locations where the wave interferences cause constructive interference. And standing wave patterns are only possible at specific wavelengths which create, in the case of nodes on either end of the medium, integer multiples of half wavelengths of the wave. Thank you very much for learning with me today. I enjoyed learning with you.
So as we saw in the video demo, standing waves are produced when the waves are um, allowed to bounce back and forth between boundaries. So for example, if we have a string tied between two posts here, these waves are gonna bounce back and forth and they're gonna interfere with each other. And um, this, uh, we saw something like this in the uh, video that you just watched. Um, the yellow wave here is going to the right. The, um, it's hard to tell what color that is. It looks like it's light blue, is moving to the left. But what we actually see is the purple wave. And that's the superposition or the addition of those other two waves. And notice the purple wave, it just bounces up and down. It doesn't travel left or right. And so this is the phenomena of a standing wave. Um, what we also saw in the video is that, you know, these standing waves, they set up a pattern of fixed nodes and anti-nodes. And so this is a, a self-interference phenomenon. So with a string, you know, this is the first mode of vibration. There's basically one hump here. This is also called the fundamental frequency. The second allowed mode of vibration, um, which is sometimes called uh, the second harmonic, is there's two humps basically here. And this, and this is showing what it's actually doing over here, how it's vibrating up and down. And then the third mode would have three humps. And you remember that uh, the humps are called anti-nodes. And then the places where the string is basically not moving, uh, which are the two ends, and then also these minimum uh, positions here are called nodes. Um, the mathematics of standing waves, we got a little sense of this in the video as well. I'm not going to go through this in great detail, but basically it's just um, looking at, you know, here's our first mode here, M equal 1. Here's our second mode of vibration, M equal 2. And here's our third mode. And remember that there are more than just three. These There are actually, in theory, an infinite number of them. You, there's M equal 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and so on. But this first uh, fundamental one here, this is half a wavelength, because remember a wave has to go up and it has to go back down. So um, the length here, L, um, is half of the wavelength. So the, the actual wavelength of this wave here is two times the length of the string. And so for all of these um, patterns here, the wavelength is 2L over M, where M is the mode number. And by using our formula between uh, velocity, frequency, and wavelength, we can solve for the frequency of these standing waves. It's equal to M, where M is, again, just an integer, 1, 2, 3, 4. That's our mode number. And multiplied by the speed of the wave divided by 2 times the length of the wave. There are some interesting examples of standing waves um, other than uh, waves on a string. For example, um, a laser pointer or an industrial laser um, has a laser cavity with light bouncing back and forth between mirrors, basically, in, on the ends of this cavity. And when the light is bouncing back and forth extremely fast, right, it's traveling at, you know, close to the speed of light here. Um, and as a result, it sets up a standing light wave. And this standing wave produces a laser beam, which is then extracted from this laser cavity. Um, a microwave oven um, is another interesting example where there are standing microwaves, because what happens inside the microwave oven, this is um, what's called a cavity resonator. And the walls of the microwave oven are metal. And so the microwaves bounce off these walls and they set up standing waves, regions of high amplitude, which are the anti-nodes, and regions where there is no amplitude, which are called the nodes. So um, in the old days, the microwave ovens didn't have a rotating platform, and there would be hot spots and cold spots inside the oven due to the presence of these standing waves. Remember, standing waves don't move. They literally stand still. Um, and so um, one... Uh, one experiment that you could do in an old microwave oven, or even a new one, if you take out the rotating uh, platform, is um, you can place uh, butter along, uh, say, a plate inside the microwave, and wherever the hot spot is, you'll find the butter, <laughs> the, the butter melts, and in between the hot spots, there are cold spots where the butter will not melt. And um, there's an interesting um, experiment you can do. You can actually measure the speed of light by measuring the wavelength of these hot and cold spots in your microwave. 
Um, okay. One of the most fascinating effects of standing waves are acoustical uh, standing waves, which are standing sound waves. And we can see how it works here um, with this animation. So this picture on top, this is a right traveling sound wave. So remember what sound is. It's basically uh, vibrations of the air molecules forming compressions, which are these dark regions where the molecules are closer together, and rarefactions in between. So you can see the compressions here are moving to the right. So this is a, a in here we can graph the pressure versus position, and we have a right traveling wave. Well, if this sound wave bounces off the end of this tube here, then we're going to have a left traveling wave coming back the other way, and that's what's shown here. But what we actually hear, of course, is the effect of both of these waves superimposed um, on top of each other. And look what happens when we combine them. We get a standing sound wave. So notice these um, regions of uh, nodes and antinodes, they don't change position. They just alternate high and low, um, as is shown down here. So this is an example of a standing sound wave, and we'll be seeing um, demonstrations of this um, in the next chapter when we talk about musical instruments. This is uh, just another uh, showing the standing sound waves um, inside of tubes here where we have high, high pressure here and low pressure uh, rarefactions here. So these are compressions and rarefactions. And again, when these are added together, we get the standing wave uh, pattern. We'll finish here with uh, a, another um, very entertaining um, video demonstration that another professor has done um, using something called a Cladney plate. And um, what we've been talking about so far in this uh, chapter is one-dimensional standing waves. And they're the simplest to envision because the wave is just moving in one direction, you know, horizontal, for example. But there are standing waves in two dimensions or even three dimensions that are a little more complicated. And we're not going to get into the details, but we can look at some of the fascinating effects of them. So um, in the video, you're going to see example of uh, two-dimensional standing waves that are produced in a very clever way using a steel plate mounted to a speaker that plays a pitch and by sprinkling salt crystals on top of the plate the salt crystals will dance around and and move wherever there are vibrations but wherever there are nodes where the plate is not moving the salt crystals will settle there because there's no uh, vibrations. And so these white lines here show the pattern of salt crystals, which mimic the pattern of the two-dimensional standing waves. And so you'll get to see as the frequency is increased, a lot of interesting patterns like this are produced. So enjoy that video, and um, then we'll regroup uh, for part two of this chapter later. Uh, these are known as what? Salt. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we did this before you said. Yeah. So we, we call this. It was in four years. Yeah, it was in four years. So we weren't reading. So we just looked at it. Like Ooh. Like Ooh. Ooh. Okay, okay, we'll turn it on and see what happens. Yeah. And I'm on the hundreds zone. I am. I need to do two things here. I'm going to change the frequency on this button and the amplitude on this button. Except it's going to be kind of tricky. So I'm going to change the frequency. John is going to increase or decrease the amplitude as I call it, as I call it out. So we turn it on. It vibrates up and down, not the biggest deal in the world, but straight away you can see where it's vibrating the most is going to be where? On the outside where the salt is. Now watch what happens when I start increasing the frequency. Feel free, once again, to show your appreciation at any stage. As soon as this starts getting boring, we stop it. The first time I saw this, I just... I couldn't believe I actually get paid to do this sort of thing. So once again, where is it not vibrating? Where there's no salt. Where there's no salt. Where there is salt. So it's vibrating there and there. I'm also a little pop heavy at this end. So I'm going to try and turn it down a little bit. Uh, you turn down the volume. Once we've got it generated, 
we can turn the volume back down. So we turn it up while we're changing the frequency. So up you go this time. And we go again. Frequency am I at here? Can you tell by these two? Nothing. One. Looking at it there, can you tell which zone on that chain? Zoning. I'm at one. Anybody else guess what frequency I'm at? 100 hertz. It's one. Any other numbers there? What scale is it on? Ah, you tell me. I can't see. Well, maybe you could move. Kilohertz. Kilohertz. Is it kilohertz? Yeah, kilohertz. So it's 1,000 hertz, right? So this guy, again, that in itself is pretty impressive. It's going up and down 1,000 times a second. Right, we got fishing again. Put more salt into it. Volume again. Okay, keep the volume constant. There you go. And back down. At this stage, I'm a bit maybe over here. I'll move that. Is that there. still vibrating? Even though we can't hear it. That is now vibrating. Can you hear it? Yeah. It's yeah. vibrating 1,000 times a second. Let's go again. The salt on it. I hope I'm not running out of salt. Turn it all the way down. These, they all the way down, is it? Yeah. Right. These are what are called Cladney plates. And patterns are known as Cladney patterns after a guy, I think it was from Yugoslavia or Serbia, one of those places. He was the guy who first came up with this. Uh, and these are, you've got standing waves. So as opposed to the traditional one dimensional standing wave on a string, here you've got some form of two dimensional standing wave. Right? So it just looks really, really beautiful. We keep going. back down. The next thing to notice is that even if he keeps the sound volume constant and I increase the frequency, technically if you increase the frequency and you keep the volume constant, it shouldn't seem any louder to us. Why does it seem louder to us at some frequencies than others? Uh, resonant frequency of the bone in your ear. So what's going on? In your ear. You're more sensitive to it. Yeah, as a res yeah, your bone actually is quite is vibrates at a specific fre frequency, so you're more sensitive to some frequencies than others. We go again, turn it up. Do it up all the way. I got one. Ooh, can we get a little bit more down? Keep going. <laughs> So Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, we're getting there. Thank you very much. We keep going. Actually, okay, different every time or something, isn't it? Yep. So it's 1,000, 1 kilohertz by 10, so it's 10,000 kilohertz. So it means two things. One, that's the frequency. The second thing is we can still uh, be sensitive to 10,000 hertz. So now we're going to go all the way back. We're going to put it at the 10,000 hertz range. You're crazy. So you're going to do two different things. One, we will find the frequencies between 1 and 2 are actually the frequencies between what and what? 10,000 and 20,000 hertz. And the second thing we should notice is as we approach 20,000, it just goes outside our levels of, of audibility. Oh, so we've got a minute left here, so we keep going. Here we go again. Can you get a bigger plate than where the patterns keep going? Yeah. I was 
thinking about my joint place. It's going up and down more quickly. When you say it's getting smaller. Yeah, but it's just fine. It's like spaces that it's not vibrating. Oh, yes, it's what I'd be right. I hadn't thought about that. That'd be right. Uh, I hadn't got that pattern before. I mean, that's very, very impressive. Let's see if I can get one more on that basis. Twitch. 